Welcome everyone. Welcome to this Riverfront Parks Now Lunch and Learn. My name is Denise Reagan. I'm the Executive Director of the Garden Club of Jacksonville. And we're so happy to help with hosting duties of this program. Um, please visit gardenclubjax.org for other programs like this uh, coming up in the very near future. If you have questions for today's speakers, please post them in the chat box. The chat box is usually um, toward the bottom right of your um, Zoom controls. Sometimes it's at the top right. And uh, sometimes you might find it under the more button and you'll be able to go to the chat. So, um, so please uh, save those questions and uh, we'll pose them to the speakers at the end of the program. Uh, right now, I would like to hand it over to one of our hosts for the, the uh, I was going to say the evening, for the afternoon, Barbara Ketchum. Hey, welcome everybody. Thank you for being here. On behalf of the hostesses, I want to thank um, all of you for being here. I want to especially thank uh, Denise Reagan, without whose expertise we would be lost. So thanks, Denise, for being our great tech person. Uh, Gabrielle Dempsey, Laura McGivney, Susan Smathers, and Natalie Rosenberg, all of us welcome you. I, I want to also thank Natalie Rosenberg, who really put this together for us. Uh, she has done a great job. And thanks, Natalie, for that. I'm going to, before I introduce our program, I want to give you just a very brief little history about who Riverfront Parks now is, who we are. Um, it's a true citizen initiative that's grown out of the members of various nonprofit groups uh, that have focused in some way or another on our downtown waterfront. Very briefly, four in particular that have addressed the downtown waterfront. One is uh, the Late Bloomers Garden Club Civic Committee, which began seven or eight years ago talking to community leaders. Uh, in fact, 40 or 50 community leaders about greening and designing and being more intentional about a plan um, for downtown and in particular our waterfront design. Uh, instead of the silo development that has been so typical for Jacksonville. At about the same time we were working on that, a group of AIA architects um, designed uh, a, a node of nodes of interest on the waterfront. You may have seen it in several issues of Arbus Magazine promoting once again, intentional design on our waterfront. Um, then after Irma, the whole city began to focus on the need for resilience and flood mitigation and St. John's Riverkeeper led that effort. They had a number of um, interest group uh, forums that covered that and that brought attention to the need for more planning for downtown. And then a fourth group, Scenic Jacksonville, which has always worked on making Jacksonville more attractive, merged boards with City Jacksonville Beautiful. And that board altogether has always understood the opportunity to make our largely city owned and vacant downtown riverfront into a vibrant, popular, resilient and economically successful district. Built for the 21st century, it's sort of too bad that we have all the vacant land we have, but it's also such a fabulous opportunity for us to get it right for the coming century. While a lot of places have buildings on their waterfronts that are gonna be difficult to make resilient, we have the opportunity to make this a riverfront for all. Uh, so about a year ago, seven of us from different organizations came together and began to call on our city leaders and uh, policymakers. Um, we have probably shown the presentation you're about to see to about 30 or 40 local groups. We've shown it to three former mayors and dozens of city leaders. Um, and we're, we're thrilled with the support that we've had um, Nancy, when she does a presentation, will tell you about 
the 11 organizations, nonprofits that have joined our coalition. So we really do speak for the public about being better trustees of this public land that we have. Our, our steering committee who, who dedicated a lot of hours in the last year, I just wanna call them out. One is Michael Kerwin, who's a local corporate attorney, Ted Pappas, Dean of the Architectural Community in Jacksonville, Barbara Goodman, who is the former superintendent of the Timaquan Preserve, has worked for the National Park Service for many years, and Nancy Powell, who is the executive director now, I've seen at Jacksonville, but also been a great community volunteer for many years, and Jimmy Orth, who's executive director of um, Riverkeeper, as everyone knows. Uh, the seven of us have been the steering committee, but it is now a really community-wide movement. And thank you for being here. I hope this means that you're gonna join it, us in our quest for nothing more than a wonderful riverfront for all that has implications in every direction for Jacksonville. So now I'm going to hand this over to Nancy Powell and Jimmy Orth, who are going to give our presentation. I think Denise has told you how to ask questions and how we'll follow up. Nancy and Jimmy, thank you again for all you all are doing. Um, take it away. Okay, um, this is Nancy. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Thanks so much for uh, taking the time today. We're gonna step you through uh, this presentation that was born out of these conversations that Barbara alluded to. And, and Barbara um, Ketchup and the Late Bloomers Garden Club literally uh, has been at this for a long time. And, and many of these ideas that we are going to talk about today are not new. What is new is that we have had um, uh, a number of changes in our downtown just in the past year, year and a half, uh, in, and, and, and with Hurricane Irma, that are causing us to rethink the downtown. Um, what you're looking at here is Memorial Park. Memorial Park is one of the few riverfront parks we have, and it's truly a well-designed, beautiful park that is used by so many, but it is mainly a, a you know, neighborhood park in Riverside. The nonprofit organizations that we have uh, have joined our coalition based on the interest of you know us giving out these presentations to many of these groups are um, including the Garden Club and Late Bloomers, um, the Duval Audubon Society has joined us, Greenscape of Jacksonville, Sierra Club, Memorial Park Association, the Jacksonville Urban League, and the League of Women Voters. Um, yesterday we heard from the American. Institute of Architects, the local AIA chapter, that they are also interested in joining us. So we are an inclusive um, coalition and um, it's uh, we are not being exclusive. It doesn't even have to be nonprofit organizations. So if you know people who are interested, please uh, let us know. We're happy to um, talk to any group that's interested. So the way they started, again, looking at kind of the recent state of downtown, um, we found a map and we've, uh, we've actually uh, color coded it here. But what you're looking at is anything in color is a publicly owned property along our downtown. Uh, from the Fuller Warren Bridge over here is the, the North Bank Riverwalk. It stops at the Hyatt here. Um, you have uh, the South Bank Riverwalk down here. Um, in green, and there's extensions going on uh, that are planned across the Fuller Warren Bridge. And, um, and so those are the river walks that have been, you know, a great asset for us. But, uh, you know, about a year, a year ago, the Jacksonville landing had come down. It's number three up here in orange, and the Landingville parking lot is number four. The number five is the old courthouse annex. Uh, that is front, in front of the newly opened up marina. And um, number six is the uh, you know, 30 year vacant shipyards, uh, 
there have been many, many failed efforts to develop the shipyards. And number seven over here on the right is a Metropolitan Park, which, um, you know, right now the, the Hart Bridge is coming down. It's very hard to even get to it, even though it is technically open. Uh, but it's been woefully neglected uh, for many years. And so we looked at this map and, and on the South Bank, you've got um, Friendship Fountain here. Um, but not as much available land on the South Bank. Uh, the district is over here in this vacant area, and that has most recently that was that was a private, you know, privately owned by JEA, and so um, it's now privately owned by the the district investors, um, and that has their own plans. So we looked at this though and said, wow look at the opportunity that we have to rethink how we can use our riverfront. And we looked uh, for inspiration from other cities. And so what we have found is that it's not just one city, it's, it's just dozens of cities who have really invested in the public infrastructure along their riverfronts for parks and green spaces and to attract investment from the business community. So our vision became, a connected network of active parks and extensive green space to include a signature park along the downtown riverfront. You know, we started out with uh, a plea to the downtown investment authority that they take a, a holistic vision um, to rethink this and, and to create what we feel would be a, a community supported master planning effort that we can all get behind. The benefits are just numerous and overlapping. And that's what's so cool about this is that providing a gathering place for a, the community, um, including all of the recreational health wellness benefits that go along with that social benefits. And in the age of COVID, the need to be outdoors has just exploded. Um, but also to stimulate economic development. And we found in, in many other cities that this kind of investment truly does this. And then thirdly is creating a more resilient riverfront. So we know after Hurricane Irma, and we know from all the studies of climate change that the next 50 to 100 years are going to be a shock to our earth. And we have got to be anticipating that. What you're looking at here is the current state of Metropolitan Park. In the foreground, you see the fire museum, the uh, marina that is right in front of it. It's a public marina. Um, and then the old festival lawn uh, that used to host, um, uh, you know, Shakespeare at the park and jazz festival and all sorts of things. So, Starting with Grant Park, I'm from Chicago and I would come down to the lakefront um, uh, pretty much every week when I was in high school. And Grant Park, which is what you're looking at here, is a great example of you know, a, a civic space that was reserved 100 years ago for the citizens of Chicago. But it wasn't always in as good a shape as it is today. In the 80s, Grant Park was kind of a sketchy place, but they have reinvested in this public space and it is truly amazing today. In the far corner is the famous Millennium Park, which has the several major art sculptures the Pritzker Pavilion is right next to it where the, the Chicago Orchestra plays. There's a major um, uh, kids park called Maggie Daly Park over here also. And in the foreground is Buckingham Fountain, which has been there for a long time. It changes colors at night. It's just a fabulous place. But what's interesting about Chicago a is a, are a couple things is number one, look at the buildings across from the road. This is among the most valuable real estate in Chicago because it has lake views and it has park views. And so that's where you know, the, the real estate and the parks and the civic spaces can go together. Also, Chicago is connected to 18 miles of parks and beaches and trails along the lakefront. And that has been in place for many years. But in the past decade, it's also uh, been connected to the Chicago Riverwalk. And the Chicago, this is just one segment. Each block of the Chicago Riverwalk has a different theme and uh, some of which are very active with, with cafes and bars and uh, outdoor spaces. And this is a, um, 
a place to learn about the river. These are floating wetlands and community gardens. Uh, you can see the kayakers. Uh, the Chicago River is a, it, it didn't used to exist. This was a, a dead uh, space underneath um, Wacker Drive. But then we say, okay, we're not Chicago. Let's look at some mid-sized cities. Here we have uh, Detroit. Detroit is making major investments in their city. To, and this is one of many transformational projects. It's a 22 acre park, $50 million, attracting 3 million uh, visitors annually. It's also connected to um, the Joe Lewis Trailway system, similar to our Emerald Trail. And that is another theme that we know is successful, is connecting these trail systems and the downtown riverfront. Louisville is one of my favorite examples because it's a small city. They only have about 5,500 downtown residents. And you know, that's about the number of residents we have today. Our goal is 10,000 downtown residents. Um, but this is an 85 acre park. It was built in three phases. It was not all built at one time, but it has been so successful that they are adding 22 more acres to this park. Another view of this park is it's, it's a major gathering place for many different kinds of events. And you can see the similarities here with the, the little inlet for the boating activities, as well as the Yum Center in the, in the background is a basketball arena and the downtown area is just across the roadway. So um, uh, even the other piece about Louisville is it's on the Ohio River. There's a pedestrian bridge that goes over to Indiana and uh, Clarksville, Indiana is in investing in another major riverfront park on that side of the river. And so they're looking at this as regional destination for waterfront activities and to, um, to impact the uh, economic impact that they have today of $40 million. Uh, of course, this is all pre-COVID guys, but um, attracting 2.2 million visitors each year. In Memphis, this park, it's 30, 30 acre park. It is, it broke ground in the fall of last year. It's, um, it has four distinct zones in it. And this is another uh, theme that we've seen is that you need a certain amount of space. 30 acres, 32 acres is kind of about the minimum that we see because they want, Memphis has Memphis in May, they have big blues festival. They have, they want places where there are, ab you're able to have festivals and community gathering as well as nature areas. They're gonna have a, uh, a tree walk in their nature area where you can go up into the trees. I can't wait to see what that's about. But they also are investing this in the connections, the perpendicular connections. Sometimes you hear that in urban planning circles where you want to connect to the inland, to the downtown uh, core, and they have the National Civil Rights Museum, which is a fabulous museum. Um, and, and this is, you know, Memphis has a, a park in the middle, it's called Mud Island of the Mississippi River, but this park they wanted to be closer, um, you know, so that the connections to downtown are, are made. Brooklyn Bridge, we included this, even though it's in New York, um, because of the similarities of, and the uh, attractiveness of the adaptive reuse of fishing, of uh, shipping piers. And so these, this is 85 acres in total, uh, and it has ball fields on one and, and other activities on the others. But the other thing that is significant here is you can see the development on the, on the right-hand side, and that development has uh, an arrangement with this park to where their fees help fund the maintenance and improvements of the park. And so uh, development and parks can go together. There's a variety of different funding mechanisms. We can talk a little bit more about that. Uh, but this is, the development is on 10% of the land, uh, but it contributes 90% of the park's budget. Smale Riverfront Park is one of my favorites. I've been here, it's, a, it's really an amazing park. You can see the Main Street Bridge type of a bridge that goes across here. And it's 32 acres, um, built in, finished in 2015. Um, and go to the next phase, page. 
Um, but it's look at the similarities with um, the stadium. So it's not just one stadium, but two stadiums. Um, and you can see it's, uh, it's all on the river side of the road. This is built for resiliency. There's a lower section and a higher section. Um, the, also, what's notable is this major development in between the two stadiums. It's called the Banks. It has another uh, development arrangement with, to help maintenance with the parks. But even on that side of the river, there's significant park space in front of those buildings. So any of those buildings have river, have river views, um, as well as the benefit of these parks. And, and I will say that most of these rivers that you're talking about here are nowhere near as, as beautiful as the St. John's River. Here's another view of uh, kind of their river walk. So artistic shade structures and places to sit to, um, are very attractive. Another place, play area, which can be you know, interactive, provide a respite from the heat and bring people together of all walks of life. Columbus, Ohio, um, they did this where they actually created this park. Um, um, a few years ago, and it's been a very successful park, um, previously neglected civic asset. And it was, uh, again, a public-private partnership that invested $44 million. Um, and while they did that, they established an endowment for maintenance. This is also connected to a greenway that is 10 miles long. You can go on your bike way uh, you know, in and out of the city. Here's another view of one of the segments within that same park. So I'm gonna turn it over to Jimmy. He's gonna talk a little bit more about some how these parks are, uh, are built for resiliency. Thank you for having me today, everyone. Um, yeah, as you can see from all of these parks, I think that's one of the things that really struck us when we were doing our research is all of the co-benefits that parks can provide. When we originally started creating parks, you know, years ago, centuries ago. The idea was more around recreation. Now we recognize that there's obviously the health and wellness benefits, which we've realized how important those are, frankly, during COVID and having opportunities to get outside, but also that they can be drivers and catalysts for economic development. So many of these communities are actually looking to parks as a form of incentives, uh, frankly, to drive development because development wants to be around parks and people want to be around parks. And it also, it increases property values adjacent to these parks. Another thing that that cities are using and another co-benefit is the benefits from resiliency. And so looking at how can we have natural infrastructure along the waterways so that it can help to serve as a buffer for storm surge, help protect us from sea level rise, and also help to mitigate flooding concerns in the urban core. Now this park, I love this park, it was actually a former industrial site, but before it was an industrial site, it was a, it's a floodplain along the river. And so what they did is they went back and, and essentially kind of tried to recreate what was once there with these, these um, man-made wetlands that they've created. And there's bioswales and other features that help to protect the city from storms. They realized during Hurricane Sandy just how vulnerable New York is. And so this is just one of many parks throughout New York City that they're using for this purpose. Now, some city, just like New York, Boston realizes how vulnerable they are to sea level rise and storm surge as well. And they have really looked at their entire riverfront. And they're taking all of the parks that they currently have and they are starting to create a network of green spaces along the waterfront. In some cases, it means retreating from the waterfront. So they're moving facilities back from the waterfront. It's, it, it's also creating enhanced wetlands and added natural infrastructure features to existing parks, existing public spaces so that they can, it can serve as a buffer for future storms. Another thing that you're seeing in parks is that they're using parks to capture stormwater. I love this park. I was there a few years ago on vacation with my wife and went to this park. But at the time, I had no idea I was standing on top of this massive underground cistern that's helping to collect stormwater. What that does is it helps prevent flooding in surrounding areas.
but also helps to treat that water and slow it down before it actually makes its way into the, um, into the river. Um, this part too is also really interesting because Cumberland, which this is Cumberland and the adjacent park that's right behind the stadium riverfront park, that they actually, with, after they were built, they helped catalyze a billion dollars in investment within just two blocks of those park boundaries. So it shows you the power of parks to help to be a catalyst for development, but also at the same time, serving those recreational needs and also helping to protect city from flooding and treating stormwater. I love talking about Chattanooga because they're really the pioneers of looking to their waterfront, creating natural spaces, parks along the waterfront that can benefit the community as a tool to revitalize um, uh, the downtown. They realized about 30 years ago that they had to do something dramatic to transform the city. They were in economic decline, former industrial city. And at the time in the 50s and 60s, this city was actually one of the most polluted in the country. They're, they actually had the worst air pollution, air quality in the United States. And they realized they had to do something transformational. And what they did is they looked to these assets they had along the waterfront and created this incredible network of public spaces, river walk, museums, cultural spaces, civic spaces that you can access on both sides of the water. This one's a relatively newer park that they actually looked at former industrial site, former brownfield that they converted into obviously a park for recreation, but it also serves an important purpose as we'll see on this next slide. It was also designed to capture stormwater to help uh, flooding concerns, but also to treat that stormwater before it goes into the into the river. You can see here down this wetland system down here with these little weirs that it, the water flows in through there is helped to be slowed down, treated, and then released into um, the river so that it's cleaner. Um, and it also helps prevent flooding, but it also obviously provides a great opportunity for recreation. Another feature is that we're starting to recognize that we need to work with nature and not try to work against it and to accept the realities that in some areas they're low lying, they were meant to flood. This was actually essentially a drainage ditch at one time and, and Buffalo and they've created this really great network of urban park um, system and trails along this, um, this waterway but it's designed to flood, it's in a floodplain. And so what it does, this park is after they've redesigned the, nat the channel of this waterway and, and implemented some green infrastructure along its banks, it now can help to hold stormwater, preventing flooding in the, in the adjacent urban areas, but also provide a great recreational resource and asset for the community. In the next slide, you'll see what it looks like after uh, of a flood. So this park was designed with the idea that this would flood at some point peri periodically would flood. And so all of the infrastructure, including this building you see, is all designed to flood so that it can actually be quickly cleaned up and returned to a park for recreational purposes. And then Smale, uh, we, um, Nancy mentioned that earlier, and you can see this is too built in a floodplain. They recognize, you know what, we're not going to be able to stop the water necessarily. So we'll just have to design with that in mind that it will flood eventually, and we need to be prepared for that. And so this too is an example of how you can design with flooding in mind, and it can actually help protect the surrounding infrastructure. Um, I think in Jacksonville, one thing we realized, obviously, from Hurricane Irma, and, and I say hurricane because honestly, when it, when it passed us 70 miles to the west, it actually was downgraded to a tropical storm at that time, yet caused category three flooding in the urban core. And so if you had had built, we had had buildings built to the, to the shore's edge of the river, those buildings would have been significantly impacted and natural areas can actually help to be a buffer for our downtown. So um, bringing it back to Florida, we wanted to look at a couple of, uh, you know, our sister cities, Tampa and St. Petersburg. And both of those cities are really booming. And they're a good example of what you can do um, with your waterfronts. They both reinvested 
in their waterfronts within the past 10 and 20 years, and, and they have results to show for it. So this is the Curtis Hickson Waterfront Park. Um, I think this was completed in 2010, or at least revitalized in 2010. And it's an eight acre park. So it's not a, a huge park. It's very similar to our landing in the sense that our landing is about seven acres. And this park in Tampa is right next to their performing arts center. It's also along the 2.5 mile Tampa River Walk. One of the things that Tampa did is they extended their river walk early on down, way down towards an, uh, a uh, former industrial site. And it is now the Armature Works, which I'll talk about. But this particular park is the uh, center of a lot of special events and a very, very popular place. Um, you, the, across the river, you're looking at the University of Tampa, those famous uh, uh, towers there, um, which is on the other side of the river. And this park on that side of the river is uh, was completed in 2018. It's a 25 acre park. So these two parks are, are not exactly just across, but uh, not too far away. It um, It's an active park with athletic fields and a performance boathouse. When they wanted to redevelop this part of uh, the riverfront, um, they wanted to do it as part of a revitalization of West Tampa. Um, and they went out into the community to find out what this community wanted in their riverfront parks. And so that's another key thing that we have been touting is that whatever plan we make along the riverfront needs to be community supported with substantial, robust, meaningful community engagement. And that's what we've been asking for. And I think the public conversation is starting to happen. Um, but this is another, uh, you know, this, this, uh, Performance Boathouse here has regattas and a place, this cove here in the middle is allows people to learn how to paddle boat without going out into the river. It's a safe space to do that. And you can see this place uh, has, is a home to a, a lots of special events as well with this big uh, gathering area. Here's a couple of views of the Tampa River Walk. Um, and they've got some great amenities and artwork. They've got historical uh, se sections. So it, it really is a good uh, model. And we've done some good work on our River Walk and we can do a little better, we feel like. Um, here's the Armature Works uh, the down at the end uh, where you can see this is a private, you know, private business. These are uh, food hall and restaurants in this area. So it's not, it's not a city uh, led thing, but they have substantial outdoor space overlooking the river. And there's a park right nearby. There's another park right nearby. And they're extending this, um, the river walk past, um, you know, down, you can see on the right hand, on the left hand side, there's this, you know, kind of open space. So they're continuing to build it. And, and Tampa just got a grant to um, expand their river walk by 22 miles. In St. Petersburg, another great example. St. Pe My daughter lives, uh, she now lives in Tampa. She used to live in St. Petersburg. It's a very young and vibrant and artsy place. Um, they started, uh, you know, 20 years ago with Rick Baker, the, uh, the mayor Rick Baker and, and others to really focus on preserving and enhancing their waterfront. Now they did, they do have waterfront all along in six different waterfront districts, they have a plan for each of those districts. This is the wide in the middle. It's a, a historic pier that's been rebuilt three times. So this is the third iteration of it, but they it's not really just a pier, it's a pier park because it's 26 acres, it has a beach, it has seven, you know, uh, three restaurants, it has a discovery center. Um, and they did spend $92 million, but they expect an $80 million annual economic impact from this, this part of St. Petersburg. Here's a view of kind of the middle of the pier where they have some, uh, they also built for stormwater and uh, uh, landscaping, native landscaping. And they have a major piece of experiential public art. This was the Janet Elkelman structure, sculpture. Um, it's hard to even describe it, but you know, it's meant for people to sit underneath it and look up and experience it in different ways. Uh, this part of the pier was privately funded, um, but the rest of the pier was mostly, uh, mostly publicly funded. And there's a variety of different 
uh, ways of funding. But what's important about St. Petersburg, if you've been there, is that it, it, the public space all along the riverfront. And when we say public space, there are lots of, there are a number of museums along the way. So museums and restaurants, our vision is a riverfront for all to enjoy. And that means, it doesn't mean that everything has to be publicly managed. It just means that whatever's there should be available to the general public. And, and those parks that we just saw are just some of others. So Pittsburgh is a great example. They've done this a long time ago. Tulsa, Oklahoma, Omaha, Nebraska, Buffalo, New York, Charleston, Lakeland, the list goes on, Indianapolis, the list goes on. And so when we looked at all of these examples of cities that are investing in their waterfronts, we have a hard time thinking that Jacksonville can't do it. <laughs> Where the, that that for all the things that for all the advantages of our St. John's River, we can do this. We have the Emerald Net, uh, Trail uh, network that is breaking ground this fall. It's a great example of a public-private partnership. Uh, they developed a master plan. The master plan was adopted by city council and it's getting funded privately and publicly and it's breaking ground and it's gonna be a fabulous uh, addition uh, to our, our downtown area. And what it's gonna do is it's gonna allow people to go downtown on their bicycles and walking. And once they get downtown, we feel the complimentary having a uh, waterfront park system will perfectly complement this Emerald Trail and really um, bring people downtown like it, it uh, and have things to do when they're downtown. So the opportunity, um, we focused some on the North Bank River Riverfront because that's where the available city owned lands are. You know, when some of cities want to expand their, their park systems, and, and I was just reading about Denver who wants to do that, but they might have to go buy the land in order to do that. And that can be a complicated process. We have the land and we feel that we um, need to be thoughtful about how to invest in this um, for the next hundred years. We're, the landing came and went within 30 years. And so we are looking out Memorial Park on the other hand was built in 1920 or 1924 maybe. Um, and so it's been there a hundred years and so Park systems can, if they're well done and well maintained and improved, and, and we totally understand that if you don't reinvest in, in them, um, then you get Metropolitan Park where you have today, but it doesn't have to be that way. Here's one view of what, what it could look like. And we, um, you know, we're not at the stage where we're designing the park, but um, it's definitely uh, one of many opportunities and, and uh, if anybody went to the meeting the other day, uh, a really good piece of news is that the DuPont Fund is going to be engaging on uh, how this process can unfold in a really good way. So uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, uh, the funding for, for Riverfront Park uh, Parks, but the the uh, the point is is that it doesn't lie in any one uh, bucket of money. There's private sources, public sources. There are grants, federal and state grants. There are tax increments, districts, and um, from the private sources perspective, um, you know, we feel that a conservancy model of uh, public, you know, like a Memorial Park Association, is needed for the downtown riverfront parks, um, and that's a model that many other cities have. So we are we are looking into that. Um, right now. And, um, and the benefits from a financial standpoint, there's, a, there's a, a document on our website called the Economic Impact of Parks. It shows uh, many studies from other uh, cities that show that it can spur and accelerate downtown revitalization um, because it attracts people and people attract um, other things, right? They have spending money in town and out of town visitors. So again, here's uh, kind of the North Bank view of the publicly owned lands, and it can be um, a, a gathering place 
for the community where, and, and when we say parks, I just wanna be clear that this is, this are the parks built for the 21st century, which are 365 day a year parks. You'll need programming that will be important, but it's a place where you can go and enjoy any day of the week, just like you can go to Central Park or any of your favorite parks in other cities. You can go and stroll and enjoy the nature, the views, and you know, hopefully get uh, a cup of coffee or a beer or a glass of wine and, um, and do other things. Um, go to the museum and frequent um, other parts of, of downtown. So we've been asking for a riverfront master plan. Um, it's kind of a complicated uh, topic of, you know, there's different levels of, of plans. There's urban plans, there's park plans, there's strategies. And, and um, so, um, but our, our issue has been that we really feel like we need to prioritize the public as, uh, access uh, and the public waterfront lands and, um, and get the public involved in what kind of park that they want to see. Do they want pickleball courts? Do they want to have um, kayak launches? You know, what kinds of things, activities would bring people downtown? And let's ask the public um, what that would be. So, um, you know, hey, real quick, Nancy, on that, which is interesting. I just want to reiterate that those were not even when, when what it takes to make it happen were not things we just came up with. Um, those are actually taken from the best practices of all these other cities. I mean, that's what we've seen time and time again, is that these other cities, they're, they're engaging the public to develop a shared community vision, developing a master plan, prioritizing public access, and then obviously it takes leadership and they have to commit to investing in it, updating it, but it really is something that there's a formula for success that's been proven time and time again in these other cities. And it's paid off significantly for so many of them in terms of economic return for their downtowns and revitalization, but also the community benefits from more access to the river and opportunities for recreation. And then of course the resiliency benefit that I think is just huge. And, and I just wanna add, there's really a lot of things going on downtown. Uh, we took a, a walking tour uh, about a week, two weeks ago with Ennis Davis and the people from the Jackson. And there are a lot of, um, of development in process in the core downtown. A lot of them are adaptive reuse, although there is uh, the JEA new, new construction headquarters. Um, and so there, there's the landing design competition. There's this new lift every voice and sing park. Um, there's, um, there's a lot of things that we can build off of. Uh, but what we are missing is this major um, waterfront park system um, that is, uh, you know, it's more than pocket parks, you know, pocket parks are great, um, but we, we need both, you know, it's like a both and. So, um, so uh, what you could do is, you know, talk to your friends, um, advocate with us, um, participate in, sometimes there are uh, decision making that are, that are done at either the city council level or the downtown investment levels. Send us your feedback and ideas and I'm gonna stop here because we wanna hear your questions. All right, thank you, Nancy and Jimmy for um, a fantastic presentation. And I learned, I've seen this multiple times and every single time I learned several new things. So, uh, you know, there's no shortage of um, knowledge to be gained. Um, so we do um, have a question. Um, someone has raised her hand, Randy Evans. Um, so I'm going to ask you to unmute and ask your question. Randy? Here I am. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Try again. Randy, try one more time. Can we do a gallery view maybe? Yeah, I'm going to do that, but I'm trying to do several things here. So Randy, can you, un there you How about go. now? Can you hear me now? That's great. Thank you. Great. So just a little bit of credentials. I worked um, for the city of Baltimore doing downtown development and then ran a nonprofit in Richmond doing downtown development. And the, the last five years I was with CSX, I was responsible for all of their real estate. So um, I, not that Jimmy and Nancy need uh, this underscore, but I I really want to emphasize a couple of points that they made that I think 
this whole group needs to be uniform about. And, and the first is there's got to be a plan. Um, Pete Carpenter, rest his soul, um, nominated me three times for the Downtown Development Commission and all three times uh, I didn't make it to the uh, actual appointment because I was an advocate for having a plan. And uh, if, you, if you don't have a plan, this is something that Jacksonville, we, we've missed. We, we've got to have a plan. And this plan um, must include, in, in my vision, in my view, not only um, permanent public space for parks, but temporary space for parks that can be programmed for public use and activity and getting people um, comfortable with being downtown and enjoying downtown and feeling safe about being downtown and finding a place to park and all of those things. So, so the, the first thing is there's gotta be a plan. The, the second thing is that you, you can't um, make sure that the developments happen one, two, three, but, but there is a logical progression for where private development would occur. And so um, there, there needs to be, in addition to the overall plan, there needs to be a development plan or schedule and then, it, then there needs to be focus on making that happen. Too often, you know, we get distracted. So the first thing is the plan. The second thing is, you know, a schedule to, to hold to that programming. Um, this doesn't happen just because we have smart people and, and they're all who um, is, that's their job. It's to program the public spaces and it's to think about all of the activity. And that would include not just events, but the public relations that is, that is related to all of that. Um, and finally, and then I'll, I'll stop being so long-winded on this. The, the last thing I would add is that uh, now is the time as part of this overall plan that there's so much public space that issues like permanent view corridors and height build backs uh, revenue sharing for the uh, maintenance of public parks those type of things have to be built into the plan at the beginning it can't be sort of added on uh, at the end and i recognize these things uh, from my own personal experience are are foreign ideas to uh, our jacksonville home but but the, but but these are things that that this group needs to be uh, consistent and, and advocating. So anyway, thank you for inviting me to um, listen in. I'm really excited about um, what you've done other towns and everything. And uh, I'd love to stay um, involved as you go forward. So thank you. Thank you, Randy. Those were great comments. I think that's the thing that, you know, we're, we're not, urban planners, we're not, you know, real estate experts like Randy and others on this call, but we just saw the benefit in other communities that a master plan can make these, these can bring these type of transformation, transformational um, uh, projects to, to life and can really truly transform downtowns. And so I think it's critical. I mean, St. Petersburg is a great one to look to because they put the work in. They included the community to ask them what they wanted, what to, to have a shared vision, and they're executing. And that new park that they opened up is phenomenal, as you could see in the slides. And it's happening all over the country. And so I think, you know, we have a fear also of involving the public. Somehow we are not going to like what we hear. But um, I think in Jacksonville, that's another component is we need to have the public at the table to help decide the future of these lands that we own, frankly. And what, will, what is that plan for the future for those, for those properties? All right. Um, do we have any other questions from the audience? I know there was a question earlier about um, before pictures of the parks that you showed in the presentation, which would show just how far those spaces have come. So I think that would be a great addition to this presentation is to show the before pictures of those parks as well. Any I don't have a question, I just have a comment. 
Sorry, Denise. No. Um, I just personally came back from Tampa this past weekend and, and have the luxury of going quite often. And I have to say, you know, I can't say enough good things. I haven't been to the St. Pete one, but uh, what they've done in downtown Tampa and how much time I personally spend when I'm visiting there on that two and a half mile stretch. I don't even have young children. Um, and I enjoy being out there for the whole afternoon, whether or not it's walking it, visiting one of their destination restaurants. Um, so, I mean, what you have um, presented is everything that I wish to see here in Jacksonville. I just want to thank all of y'all that it's, it's fabulous. And I wish so bad that there was somewhere that I could go downtown right now and say, hey, I want to rent a paddle boat or I want to rent a kayak or, you know, just like they have in Tampa and, and have that as a resource. And sadly, I don't know where to do that. Thank you, Tiffany. That's a great comment. You know, it's funny because I, I, um, it, you know, I have not. We have, we have nothing against obviously Shad Khan, and we welcome the fact that he wants to develop in the city and help it. But it's just kind of interesting that there's debate about, well, why can't we have uh, four seasons? You know, some people are having that kind of argument. Well, I would argue, why can't we have some of those parks that these other cities have? You know, and I think that's the opportunity that we really have. We have, we can have both. I mean, a, a, a nice hotel doesn't necessarily have to be on the waterfront either. Um, and that should be a question about where should it be located that, you know, it's public land land. We should have a say and have a, have a conversation about that. But I think we can have the things that these other cities have. You know, we are, we, um, we actually have in some ways more opportunity because we have more publicly available lands there's a lot of room to build out in Jacksonville. In addition to adding park space, we have a lot of other lands for private development. And we have the best, one of the best rivers in the country flowing through the heart of our community. So I think the opportunity here is immense. We really do, are in an enviable position. We just have to take advantage of the opportunity. Um, so we have a comment about um, as long as taxes are not increased for this major project, um, so something to think about and maybe to respond to. And then I also have a hand raise that we'll uh, call on Steve Atkins in a minute here. Did you wanna to react to the taxes issue? Well, the fun, there's lots of different funding opportunities. Most of them are public and private combinations and a lot of them have started with grants. So, so um, for example, anyway, I, I don't wanna get into it further. We can, we can maybe schedule some other um, conversations about it. It's a, long, it's a longer conversation. Yeah. All right. And there was, let me just say real quick, Denise, I just, for instance, got an email from uh, the program manager for the National Recreation and um, Parks Association yesterday. She sent me a list like, you know, as soon as I asked within five minutes, probably six, seven different grant opportunities for cities to develop parks and, of course, incorporate resiliency into them and things like that. So there is a lot of different funding sources that don't rely necessarily on taxes. All right, Steve, uh, would you like to ask your question? Sure. Well, first of all, let me just offer a comment to say thank you for the opportunity to uh, share in your presentation today. It was really well done, and I would commend uh, both Nancy and Jimmy on, on, on their work as well as the rest of the group. I had the pleasure of knowing a number of the ladies in your organization uh, personally and I uh, think very, very highly of the group. So, um, thank you for the invitation today. So I, I am very interested in, in what you're describing. I think we have, as a community and, and certainly from our public sector, missed the mark for quite some time in terms of what needs to happen on, with the focus of the St. John's River downtown. It's, uh, it's our greatest asset and we certainly should have uh, a, a, a nice park system that, uh, that contributes to that. Um, it's actually a, a subject that we have studied for the last couple of years uh, as some of this public space is becoming available on the downtown uh, North Bank in particular. I'm one of the developers that uh, Nancy mentioned that are, is doing the adaptive reuse projects in downtown. And so I certainly see how there is a, um, a, a great cross uh, collateral value in, in doing this with the parks. I think that the uh, the financing and the, and, the, uh, and the funding of this is obviously a challenge. And I think that it's something that can be shared with the private sector. Um, and, I, and I would really like to continue that dialogue. We, we are gonna have some of our own thoughts uh, put together in a, in a presentation in the very near future and, and hope that you'll join us as well 
in terms of, uh, of what that looks like. I think that ultimately what if we can find the right balance between the private sector and the public sector in developing a, a comprehensive master plan, I, I couldn't agree with Mr. Evans more in his comments uh, as to how the approach needs to happen. Um, we are, we, I think that we can accomplish uh, and give everybody most of what they want. And I think that that ultimate compromise is, is gonna be a win for, for everybody. So um, thank you again. I, I, I appreciate the, the presentation It's very well done and uh, look forward to continuing the conversation. Thank you. Yeah, and I, I would just like to add one thing and that is uh, we didn't talk a lot about this today, but um, you know, parks can be really democratic places. Um, of people from all walks of life. I, I may have mentioned that, um, but we are um, you know, encouraged also by the idea that these can have social equity uh, components to them, um, where we know from some of the studies that have been done that, that there are people who have never been to the St. John's River downtown. And 90% and of the riverfront land across the county of, on the St. John's River is currently privately owned. And so if you don't, uh, you know, with very little public access, Memorial Park is probably one of the few. There's one in Mandarin. You know, there is of course the Timaquan Parks Preserve, which is fabulous. Not so easy to get to if you don't have a car. Um, and so uh, there are opportunities here that um, to provide river access and enjoyment um, for communities that, um, you know, that haven't had it in the past. And so uh, we, I had a conversation last week with the historic East Side uh, community group. There's, that's not that far from <laughs> Metropolitan Park. It's right down A. Philip Randolph Boulevard. And so, um, so, so that, is, uh, that is another component that, um, you know, we've talked with Senator Audrey Gibson about, um, you know, engaging other neighborhoods in this initiative. Thank you, Nancy. Um, do you want to kind of uh, wrap up uh, the Q&A period and then, um, you know, we'll, we'll wrap up the entire program. We're right at the one o'clock mark here. Yeah, I think, I think Laura, I'm going to introduce Laura McGevney. She's going to close it up for us. And thank you again for everybody. Um, please feel free to email either Jimmy or myself with any thoughts, ideas, and uh, we are happy to continue this conversation. And uh, on behalf of all the hosts, I just want to thank everyone so much. We know that there are a lot of things vying for your attention, and we really thank you for watching our presentation. We hope that you will continue uh, to be involved in your community and, and hopefully will support our work going forward. I would encourage you to follow Riverfront Parks now on social media. They are um, on both uh, Facebook, as well as Instagram, and you can get updates that way of uh, meetings that are important, things that are coming up, ways to get involved, issues to think about. If you have other thoughts, um, you can always reach out to Jimmy or Nancy and, and just let them know. And once again, we thank you so much for your time and attention. Again, thanks to Denise for helping us put all this together. And uh, everybody have a wonderful rest of your day. Okay, thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Bye.